we will now have a look at our very first problem, mixing things. I will give you the following problem. Imagine that you have an oil well. If you have an oil well, then what you get is some oil that is a mixture of a few different components. But depending on the oil, the fraction of these components might be different. And maybe you want to mix them in some way that you have a very specific fraction of all the components. So let's have a look at this example. You have three substances and each of them has a different fraction of the two components A and B. And now you want to mix two new substances with a different fraction of A and B. The question now is, can you mix these three substances in any way so that you can get a component Q1 with 25% A and 28% B or a component Q2 with 15% A and 15% B? Now you can try to figure out if you can solve this problem. If you have tried for a while to solve this problem, maybe you have found out that indeed you can mix the component Q1, but maybe you haven't found a way to mix uh, component Q2. And now we want to model this as a geometric problem that shows us why this is the case. So we have two fractions, we have two components here. So we can just put them onto some coordinate system. We can have x axis A and y axis B. And now each substance that we have here has a fraction of both components, so we can mark it as a point in this coordinate system. Substance S1 has a fraction of component A of 10%, so it is in this column, and it is a fraction of B of 35%, so it is in this row. So we have three points here. And each of these mixtures we want to get, of course, are also points in this coordinate system. Now. What do you think happens if we only mix the substances S1 and S2? If we only use substance S1, of course we get exactly this point. If we only use S2, of course we only get this one. If we use any combination of them, then we get all the points that lie on this straight line segment. The same way, if we only use substance S1 and S3, we get all the points that lie on this straight line segment, and if we only use S2 and S3, we get all these points. On the other hand, if we are allowed to use all three substances, then we can get all the points that lie inside this triangle. And these are exactly the points that we can get by linear combinations of these three vectors. And now we can see that Q1 lies in this point set and Q2 does not lie in this point set. That means that Q1 can be mixed by these three substances and Q2 cannot. And this triangle here for these three points is the convex hull of the point set. This gives us our very first observation. If we have a set of substances, then we can mix a new substance using those substances we are given if and only if the point that corresponds to the new substance lies in the convex hull of S. If we have more than three points, let's say a fourth, then the convex hull would look like this. And if we have an another point inside, then it doesn't matter, it doesn't contribute to the convex hull, still this quadrilateral is our convex hull. And in our example, here we only had two fractions, but th actually this observation holds no matter how many components we have. So not only in 2D, but in any D dimensions, we can mix the substances if and only if a new substance lies inside the convex hull defined by our given substances. Using the convex hull, we can solve these type of problems. There are now two things we have to do. First, we have to formally define what a convex hull is, and then we want to find out how we can compute it. So, assume you're given a point set, let's say we're still in two dimensions, how would you define the convex hull of this point set? There's one nice approach that we can use, which is the physics approach. So assume you take a piece of wood, and for each of these points, you put a nail in it. And now I take an elastic rope and I stretch it 
and let go. So we have an elastic rope like this and after I let it go it snaps and it will stop exactly at the outer nails. And this gives us the convex hull. This is the physics approach how in praxis you create the convex hull. You just take this rope and then take all the points that lie on the rope or inside. The problem for us is how do we compute this? You need a physics engine, you have to program it, and then it has to handle everything for you, and it's basically a back box. That's not something that we as theoreticians can use or analyze. So we want a more mathematical approach. We want a mathematical definition how this convex hull looks like. Can you think of something, some way, we can get this convex hull in a mathematical sense. For the mathematics approach, first we have to define what a convex set is. The mathematical definition of a convex point set is if you take any two points in this point set, let's say this point and this point, and you take the straight line segment that connects them, then all these points on the straight line segment also lie in the point set. And what is the convex hull? The convex hull is just the smallest convex set that contains all the points that we are given. So a mathematical way to write this down is that the convex hull is the intersection of all convex sets that contain our input point set. Now we have a mathematical definition and we technically could turn this into an algorithm. Just compute the intersection of these sets. So you only have to compute all the convex sets that contain S, intersect them, and then you're done. What's the problem with this approach? The problem with this approach is that this set is huge. This is an infinite number of sets. Just take any convex point set and make it larger by just a single point, and you have another convex point set that also contains our point set. So this is not feasible. We cannot really compute this. So we need a better way. We need to be smarter. We cannot look at all the convex sets, but we have to find a subset of them. Can you think of a way that helps us to reduce the number of convex sets? For this particular convex cell, we could easily describe it as an intersection of only half planes. Let's take this edge on the boundary of the convex cell and extend it. Then we get a half plane of all the points that lie below it. We take the next edge, we extend it, and now we have a half plane and the convex set lies to the right of this half plane. Take the next edge and so on until we have uh, looked at all the convex cell edges and each of them describes a half plane. And these half planes are the only ones that we need to describe this convex hull. The convex hull is also the intersection of these half planes that we created. So in order to compute the convex hull of our input set, we might as well just look at the half planes that contain the input points and not all the convex sets. This already reduces the number of sets that we have to compute by a lot. However, this is still too much. If you look at all closed half planes that contain our point set, that's still an infinite amount. So what else can we use? If you look at all these half planes, each of them goes through a corner point of our input point set. And even better, each of these boundaries of the half planes goes through at least two points of the input set. So we don't have to look at all the closed half planes, we only have to look at those that contain at least two input points on their boundary. And now this is something that we can compute. This is not an infinite amount of half planes anymore, but this is an amount that is polynomially bounded by the number of input points.